Hi. Hey there. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for um, joining us tonight for Coracle Live, Books, Bards, and Ballads. I am so, so happy to be sitting here chatting with uh, Alicia Grosso, affectionately known by her sisters as Bun, so <laughs> that's what I'm going to call her. Okay. Um, Bun makes the most beautiful soaps. She's written a couple of books. Um, I'm going to you know, share a little bit about her aromatherapy and her website and all sorts of wonderful things. So, Bun, thank you so much for joining me. I'm so happy to be here. It's so nice to see sisters and hang out. So, um, I'm going to ask you the first question that I asked you while we were chatting. What is an antiquarian? Well, an antiquarian is kind of a funny word. Um, it was the precursor to archaeology, people that were interested in old things. And I'm particularly interest in, interested in, of course, the old things that relate to us through the SOA and through, um, I, I guess, my studies into the Celtic, the Celtic field, the Arthurian field, um, Avalonianism, I guess. And so I like old rocks and places that are old. I like archaeology. I like to study the archaeology of the places that are special to our tradition. And I, um, I don't know. It's a kind of an old funny word, but I, li I, like the, I like the feel of it rather than saying, I don't know, there's all kinds of other things you could say, like you're a Celticist, um, which is great. I don't feel I've got the, the jam to say that. Mm -hmm. about myself um other than that i like celtic things um so antiquarian just seems sort of a nice old-fashioned sort of word that covered the kind of things that i like to uh that i like to study yeah when i saw it in your bio it was like what a, what a wonderful word but i i i had no idea exactly what you meant and there's a, there is a welsh word for it that's particularly impossible to say so i'm trying to i'm looking on my screen on my desktop to see if I yeah. can find where I stuck the little um, tear off that has, that has it on there. But I will, I will find it and we'll see if we can pronounce it together. I know a bunch of us are studying, <laughs> studying Welsh. Yeah, I don't know. Yet, but I know there are some people that, you know, I don't, I doubt if Tiffany will be with us, but maybe she could figure it out. Yes, that she's been doing really well. Yeah. I've gone pretty far on Duolingo, but I had to break up with him for a little while. So I haven't been um, I haven't been duolingoing very much lately, but I was doing great guns for many months. With okay, Welsh. I found the word. Is there a chat to put it in? I'm. That's what I'm looking at. Okay. Yes. Okay. Here is. Are you able to put it in? Let me see. Um, oh, I want. I can't find anywhere to put it in. I'll fig I'll figure it out. Oh, you broke up with the, broke up with a green owl. <laughs> I know, I know. Poor duo. Where? Yeah, I think that's, we go bust go gangbusters for a while. I kind of broke up too. I, I keep thinking I should take them back, but I don't know. <laughs> I have the time. I don't know. So, um, okay, let's. Um, I'm really interested in your soap making and your books. So let's want to start with your um, your first book. Okay. Um, I don't have my screen turned around. I don't know if you can do that, but um, you're going to see it backwards. So this okay. is my this was my first soap making book. Okay. And it is it has 24 formulas, and they're a lot of them are based on life events. And a lot of them are based on major holidays in the general pagan calendar. If we had to have a generic pagan calendar, it's that. Plus things like anniversaries, birthdays, um, hand fastings, uh, goddess ceremonies. Um, and that was the, the publisher that this went through was purchased by Samuel Weiser Publishing, um, their new age arm, their esoteric arm of publishing and i'm going to propose a 25th anniversary edition with them we'll see if and that'll have an update and so we'll see if we can get that off the ground 
I, that would be that would be just wonderful. Yeah, it was. So, it, there's been so much that I have learned, and so many techniques that are different now than when I wrote that book back in 2000, I think. So it would you'd add you just. It, 25th anniversary, so you would add to it? Yeah, I would revise and add to it. Yep. Add another 24 recipes. <laughs> so how long had you been making soap before you wrote the book? Uh, five years. I was making soap since 1995 in the summer. And I'd made a hand salve for, for gardening. And I was out of work after grad school. And I didn't like to be idle so I taught myself how to make soap and I was could and I couldn't stop I've never stopped making soap it's very um, alchemical it's very empowering I think it's one of the reasons women get so addicted and love it so much is because it is so you're it's not just like making Kool-Aid or something where you're taking one substance and just putting it in another substance there's actually a chemical reaction and um, it's very powerful and addicting uh, when you get to feel that power for something that is useful and beautiful and who we all want to be useful and beautiful. So, and we are actually useful and beautiful. So, um, soap making is a really, a really good way to express that. So as I mentioned, I, I've just, I've done the, the melt and pour. Um, mm -hmm. do, That's do really, the, can do so much. And what's, I took a class once and we did, I don't know, something. It was very dangerous. <laughs> it's, <laughs> exactly sure. it's sort of an updated version of my great-grandma Anna's old lye soap. She um, kept, let's see, it was, what was the story? My great, no, my grandfather, her son-in-law worked at a hamburger restaurant and collected all of the beef fat and would bring it home to my great-grandmother and she would store the fat and she made her own lye solution by taking oh. the wood ashes from the wood stove and from the heating stove and put the wood ashes in a hopper and then pour water over them, which is how you get lye, one of the ways to get lye. And she, when she could float an egg in the lye barrel, then it was time to make soap. So oh, that's fascinating. isn't that fascinating? It was like a yeah. like a low tech hygrometer where you can measure the specific gravity. And so she was able to make this, they called it grandma's brown soap. And she washed everything with it. The floor, the kids, the dog, people's mouths out. She did all of it with <laughs> grandma's brown soap. <laughs> Great grandma's brown soap. So I was so interested in that when I was a kid, but it I never really it just was always in my mind. And so this is made with beautiful, fresh, it does sound like witchcraft, I know, right? Yeah, um, it does really. <laughs> it is. It's, it's so amazing. And it's generational. It goes back, back and back and back and back in through through history. And mostly it's women who have been, been the soap makers um, and the ones that pass down the recipes and teach you how to do it. And it is, it's alchemical and... Um, I don't know. I just, every time it starts to turn into soap, it's called saponification. And every time that starts to happen, there's a real specific aroma that comes from the plain soap, the oils and the lye solution. And then all of a sudden it starts to take off and starts to get thick. And that's when you make your additions of your herbs and essential oils and beautiful colors and pour it out into molds and cut it. And you've got soap. How about that? Yeah, that's amazing. So, so you said your great grandmother. So, did your grandmother and your mother as well make soap? Or no, soap? that was on. I have many sides to my family, and that was on. Let's see, that was on my stepfather's side. Um, I was raised partially with that great grandma Anna and my grandmother Emma, were the two old ladies that lived with us, and I learned lots of things from both of them. But she never did the soap making. Never did the soap making in the house. No. But I did learn to sew from my mother and from my, from her aunt, grandma Anna, and I learned how to knit and crochet from all my other grandmas and great grandmas. So I was very lucky that I had the women in my life that I had. Right. And um, and you have a second book. Yeah, the second book came out of a couple years after um, my 
my literary agent said that she worked for one of the series called the everything series. Um, that's kind of like for dummies, but not so codependent. And so it's called the everything self making book. And this is the third edition. It's been out. Of, it's been out a long time now. And they were going to do a fourth edition, but there's really, it's the everything soap making book. There wasn't a lot to add at this point. So um, it's got lots and lots and lots and lots of recipes and lots of techniques. And, um, and it was a for, for hire kind of a book. So I could sell a million copies and it wouldn't make any difference in, in, yeah. in what, what comes to me. <clears throat> they did it as a for hire book. Um, and I enjoyed doing it. I taught myself that I could write 150,000 words. I never thought that would be possible. Yeah, I don't yeah. know if I could do that. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, I can talk 50,000 words. I just don't know if I could write 50,000 words. <laughs> so do you have a couple of soap samples? That well, I have a couple of soaps. I have one that was kind of an experiment that didn't turn out so pretty. This little... It was supposed to be pink in the middle. I don't know what happened. I used alkanet root. It's an herb that turns supposedly turns pink, but it didn't work out in this bar. So this is one bar that didn't turn out so hot, but it smells good. What? So what? What scents? What essential oils? Uh, this is actually a fragrance oil, a synthetic fragrance that's called Fairy Tale Rose, and it smells mm -hmm. like good rose fragrance, not like oh, ick, that's terrible rose fragrance. It smells like really nice not the kind of rose fragrance that gives you a headache um and it smells a lot like rose absolute which we like to use um in our workings here um with the sisterhood and then one this is from last summer it says summer mimosa and i give a little story and the ingredients on the back and then the bars in there oh that's an old bar it's got a little bit of yellow on it so there it is and what's what's the story with that one? Um, Summer mimosa is what was it? Oh, it's um, peaches and champagne, and that one is another fragrance oil. Two fragrance oils together, peach and, and a champagne scent is wonderful, like a Bellini, I think, is what they call the cocktail. So I do so many. I make so many different kinds of kinds of things with fragrance oils and. My first love, though, is essential oils, the ones that are the essential essential oils from actual plants are my favorites. So Jen is saying something about your amber soaps? Yes, I do a soap called The Idea of Amber. It's a fragrance that I, that's an, it's a synthesis of lots of different amber resins. So there's, amber doesn't really have its own scent, but we have an idea of what it is. It's like vanilla and Oh, uh, some vanilla resin uh, pitch put all put together that comes up with the scent that we identify as amber. And so the my soap's called the idea of amber is the smell of it. But I make melt and pour soap, the clear glycerin soap. And then I sculpt, I make it the color of amber and put hawthorn berries inside it because amber has occlusions of, it has, sometimes there's like bugs in there and leaves and things. And so I put hawthorn berries, which which resonates with um, Rhiannon in particular. So I put hawthorn berries in the amber soap, and then I carve it into pieces that look like chunks of amber. And they come in a little bag, and they're super cute. Wow, that sounds lovely. Yeah, they're pretty. They're beautiful. I don't have any around right now. Once I make it, everybody wants it, so it disappears fast. <laughs> Diane is talking about Grail Maiden. Yeah. Amber well, Grail Maiden is another one of my favorite ones. Um, it is a blend of frankincense and myrrh and sandalwood. And it's soft and powdery and um, warm and smooth. It's a really beautiful scent. I love that one. Yeah. And I make those, especially the Avalonian oriented soap aromas, I make those in roll on uh, perfumes also. So you can so you can have uh, a little hit of it when you're going to work in the morning. You need a little bit of idea of amber or grail made, and you can <laughs> slap it on there. <laughs> Grounded for the day. <laughs> Grounded for the day. Yep. Yep. Yeah, yep. That yep. Wonderful. 
And uh, you mentioned that you just made an incense blend. Is incense something you're incense. doing or is this new? Uh, the, incense, the incense is new. It's, I found these beautiful bottles. They are straight up and down. like They're almost like test tubes except they're flat on the bottom. And they come with a big cork that I have. The first soap I ever made was Bunny's Garden Special Garden Soap because I wanted something that m matched the salve that I had made. And the primary aromas in that are essential oils of lavender, eucalyptus, and rosemary. So I made a, a red sandalwood plus lavender plus rosemary plus patchouli leaf and then blended some essential oils of rosemary and eucalyptus in with this incense. And it has my bunny on it, which is so cute. I love my bunny. <laughs> this last one is like we need smell o vision. I know and we do. You need to sort of scratch the sniff, it. right? So that's so, the that's new incense. Yeah, it's new. It's a new, it's a prototype. It's a new product that I that I was inspired by the bottle, actually, to make it. That's wonderful. Because I'd always blend like, my own herbal blends and stuff, and I've got beautiful herbal blends from sisters who were vendors and. And Jenna had made some gorgeous incense for when we were on the when I was on the nine, and so I decided, well, why hadn't I done that yet? So I did that. <laughs> wow! Yeah, well, lots of. Uh... Oh, and what's okay now? I'm, I'm I'm trying to remember what we chatted about, and you also have the spray, the fragrance, the Calangaeus. Oh, that's a little. This is the little collector's collector's edition bottles that I do for the holidays. Um, see if you can see. It says Colin Gave on there. And it has uh, Colin Gave has a hematite. And that's all essential oils only. And Lori says that it's like her favorite smell. So that is great. Um, that makes me super happy that she likes it so much. So so no carrier oil, just the essential oils? Just the essential oil and fractionated coconut oil because you can't use essential oils on your skin without dilution. Okay. So it has six milliliters of fragrance and three milliliters of fractionated coconut oil, so it's perfume strength. Wow. Yeah, I, I'm sitting here with all this stuff. I'm thinking, wow, I was busy. <laughs> really? <laughs> what you're smelling right now must be amazing. I am. And even with my poor post COVID brain here, I can actually smell how this smells. So I should have been sm burning this when I was sick. Because it has the lovely eucalyptus in it. I love it. Yes, everyone. Bun's just getting over COVID. So we're extra honored to have her with us. Yeah, this is my first day back at work. I was out for almost two weeks. Yeah. I still feel a little hollow, but. Uh, I'm mostly fine, especially when I get to look at all the nice things I like to do when I'm not in school. <laughs> I did get a new thing that I'm going to ask if you guys are interested in and what product it would go best in. Um, they've just started having apple seed oil be available through my primary vendor. And um, it doesn't have any taste, really. It's a slightly bitter. But I was thinking that a lip balm or a perf put this as a perfume base with some beeswax and the essential oils, but the apple mm -hmm. seed oil, like absolute pressed oil from that. So, um, does it, does it smell like apples? I guess it has no, no taste, but it doesn't have a smell, but it does have a lot of essential fatty acids that would be actually linoleic and oleic acid that are really good moisturizers. Um, good for your because they're close to the sebum of human skin so they are they will go in and absorb really well and moisturize so anyway i've been thinking if anyone has any bright ideas on how to use it doesn't have a scent no um but it would be great to figure out how to use this in something especially abalonian wise because apple seeds man that's like the bomb <laughs> that'd be great <laughs> So I want to talk about your knitting and your crocheting, but I'd also like to talk about your um, drop spindles. Oh, the drop spindles. That fascinates me because uh, I can't. Cause you, okay, do you have yours? You showed me yours a little while ago. Yes, I did. I made this when I took. It's so beautiful. Uh, 
increased his course with Jenna uh, a couple of years ago. So I made this and it's got our Trisco on it in our pretty blue. Yeah, it's wonderful. I have several drop spindles in my life. Um, two of my favorites, though, have our, 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 our triple R symbol on them, which I just love. And there's a big one and there's a little one. And I don't, I don't make these. Um, if, if you find you want one, the, oh, what's his name? Spanish. Oh, yeah, and yeah. Peacock so it, makes them. It's just like Spanish. The Spanish peacock. Of course I wrote spinach. <laughs> peacock, yeah. Yeah. Spanish peacock makes these for us. And he has, a, he has a design yeah. and he does it on, on demand. I don't know how, what his prices are, but. Um, okay but yeah it's a i do i drop spindle with the spindle at the top with the whorl the bronwyn piece i mean the arian road piece i i drop spin with that arian wheel arian road wheel at the top rather than at the bottom like we see this one you can use either either way it's got a little um divot right here where you can oh, make okay. your little half hitch and put that on there so you can spin with it either direction. Um, but I find I'm more stable with it, using it as a top, top whorl, personally. That makes it easier for me. But I like to spin, I spin the singles moon-wise, and then when I ply two singles together, I ply with the heavier spindle, and I go sun-wise that way. Yeah, the three nines. Yep, three nines. Gotta love it. I'm thinking that would be something... For the coracle to do in the future is just sponsor you in a um drop spindle workshop if you would be open to that i think Jen. it would be fun we did one before when i was living in seattle when i first moved back up here from la and we did an actual live online class of me at, the, at my other house um drop spinning and it was very awkward and strange trying to figure it out but we did it we got we did a class yeah, it was yeah. fun it was i fun. Uh, watched it i wasn't like as i was playing and i was like i just couldn't do that so i was just watching it and trying to take it in so um yeah it's um it's you know, and not everybody is a, is a spin not everybody can do it i and when i was um i always suggest to sisters that you at least give it a try because it's such a powerful meditation tool it's such a powerful symbol for us um but if I want to get some yarn spun, I do it on my spinning wheels. I have a little bit of a spinning wheel problem at the moment. I've got four of them. The big ones? Yeah, spinning wheels. I got four spinning wheels. And I got rid of one. I used to have five, and now I have four. Oh, I also I have four plus one that's in pieces, so I guess that's kind of like five. Wow. It's like a thing. I guess it is a thing. <laughs> I know, and I'm trying to. I'm trying to sell my the one I learned to spin on, which is a wonderful wheel. I'm trying to sell her, um, but I don't want to ship it, so it has to be someone local to me. But if anyone local is looking for a good spinning wheel, my Ashford Traditional is um, ready to find a new home. <laughs> Jenna said you don't have a spinning wheel problem. You have an amount of limbs problem. I do. I only have. I wish I was like Holly. I could, you know, wear. Skulls and have many arms. <laughs> wow. Well, Jenna liked that idea, so we'll discuss it, and you know, I'll be in touch with you, and hopefully, we absolutely, can... that would be so fun. Everybody, yeah, it's so fun. I, I can try again. <laughs> and it's it's a fiddle. It's really a strange little thing to get it going. Once you get it going, though, I I can trance out pretty fast if I'm doing what I have always called experimental Avalonianism. If I'm trying to take something that I do and how can I Avalonize, Avalonize, Avalonize it. Avalonianize? Avalonianize? Aval Avalon, I don't know, whatever the word would be. But I can, I can do that with just about everything from scrambling eggs to spinning, you know, spinning yarn. And I can also do it if I picture in my head while I'm spinning on a spinning wheel, I can still get that energy going. It doesn't have to be with this because as we know, the center is Bronwyn, the still center, okay. the middle of everything. And then Aryan road is the wheel that goes around. And if you translate that to your 
um, bobbin and the whorl, it's just the same arrangement. It's just shaped, it's just at a different angle towards your body. And then you drive it with the big wheel. And so the big wheel a lot of time is seen as the Aryan Road piece of a spinning wheel. But to me, it's all about the whorl and the, bo and the um, spindle together. That to me makes the Avalonian energy. Uh, but it doesn't mean if you feel that the great wheel itself is, is the, is the whorl, is the wheel part, that's, there's no reason why it won't work. It's just in my own work with it. It's just the whorl and the, the spindle of the bobbin for me. If I'm when I'm spinning on a wheel that gives me that Avalonian thing. <laughs> Avalonify oh, said Di Diana. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm assuming then when you spin, you then do your crocheting or knitting from the yarn. I'm yarns. finding that I am a poor keeper upper of knitting. Um, I had a really big life lesson two years ago. Um, many big life lessons. One of them was two years ago. I went to, I decided I was going to finally get into my, my fiber stash and figure out what I was going to do with it and organize it. And I'd found that 90% of it had been destroyed by moths. Oh, what a shame. Yeah. It was really kind of heartbreaking. I had lots of hand spun, um, some beautiful wool I'd purchased in Wales that I'd spun into yarn. Um, it was a shock. Uh, but clearing out all that, all, clearing out the 90% freed me up so much because I had like in the knitters world, there's kind of the joke of the curse of the boyfriend sweater. Don't make him a sweater because he'll break up with you. If you don't want him around, make him a sweater. Right. <laughs> and so, Oh, I know a moss. Right. And so um, I had yarn that I had purchased for garments two husbands ago that I had had from the first husband. And I was going to make something for the second husband which all sat in piles. And now obviously those are, those men are gone. And I got, was carrying that energy around some of it from the eighties. Wow. Yeah. You know, um, it was really intense and it was amazing to take all of it. I thought that I'm not going to even go through it. I'm just going to take what's moth eaten and it's going to go. It's all going to go. And because I do so it's so important to me to work with textiles and with the fiber. And then I hadn't been doing it at all. Um, and then we went right into COVID after I've had this big discovery of all my moth eaten stuff. Um, it was very freeing getting rid of a bunch of, because I, for me, objects hold energy and intention and I didn't need those sweaters that I was going to make for some man years ago i didn't need that energy with me anymore so i was really yeah. it was really i mean there's so many metaphors right the yarn to spin the story to tell and so that was really helpful to get rid of all that and then covid happened and i didn't do a thing but then for my 60th birthday this year i thought i need to reopen my greater fiber self and um have been spinning intensely. Um, it's my time is divided between my job, which is ridiculously busy. And um, I'm also in grad school. And um, so I don't have, so I have to make time to sit down and do my creative work because I get so depleted from my job and grad school is great, but it's super hard. And um, I'm actually going to spend this evening spinning instead of writing or on a paper that's due. So I'm going to be spinning this evening instead, which will be very enjoyable. <laughs> Plus I, it, so if you're saying that, you know, just bringing in Avalon to it so that the spinning actually becomes a very spiritual. It is very much so. Um, this is very uh, trance like for me. I can, I can just do sort of whatever watching outlander. Right. But I can also make it part of make it ritual space because I feel so connected with the Avalonian energies with the motion of the wheel and the turn of this of the spindle I feel that so strongly um and I can 
get into that headspace pretty quickly, spinning on the wheel and um, and spinning on on the spindles also on the drop spindles. So, so you said you weren't knitting much. Are you crocheting? No, I'm not crocheting. knitting or crocheting much. But I have a good friend who is a witchy poo at heart, <laughs> and she is arachne herself. She can knit lace in the dark with beads on it. She's incredible. Mm -hmm. So I've been I've been spinning like crazy, and then sending her the yarn, and then she'll knit something and keep one, and then knit something else and send it back to me. So that's oh. pretty good. But I knit small things. I decided sweaters are beyond me. Um, so I like to knit for myself. I like to knit hand fingerless gloves. As my hands get cold when I write, um, I'm mm -hmm. typing a long time. My hands get cold, so little mitts. I make those for myself. And I also make just the top part of a turtleneck sweater. Just the turtleneck, no sweater. To wear as a cowl, and that keeps my neck warm in the wintertime. So I'm I'm an accessories knitter. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. So do you sell that stuff? I know you said your Etsy shop right now is. Yeah, my Etsy shop is closed right now because I don't know my soap inventory. So I need to do soap inventory. Um, but my metal clay jewelry is, is what I've got up there, the bronze work that I do, too. So that's Those things are in the Etsy store at the moment. Can you... Tell us a little bit about the bronze work. Uh, I've got a piece on. This is, I don't know if you can see it. It's a roundhouse. Oh, that's beautiful. Isn't that cute? It's a little tiny roundhouse with a little gem in it. And that's made out of bronze clay. It's like working in ceramics, but on a micro level. And um, you make the piece in the same techniques that you would use for pottery. But then you uh, put it in the kiln and fire it and all of the organic binder and water burn off and you're left with solid metal. Oh, this ring too. This is my little eye with ring. Oh, that's absolutely stunning. And that's made out of sterling silver clay and then you fire it in the kiln for several hours and it burns everything away and it leaves solid metal. So I know a bunch of people have bought have bought these. I think. In the, in the so you so you do sell them then? I do. Both. I have a bunch in stock actually. Good to know. <laughs> Very good to know. <laughs> I'm going to file that piece of information away. <laughs> yeah, I um, just got this. Let's see. Let me see if I can find it here. I'm just. This is my metal clay working station. I just made a beautiful owl and moon silver pendant but now it is nope it's escaping me i don't know where it is anyway i've got an, a new owl thing that i was working on but everything gets this i'm in my basement where my studio is and everything down here i just have to come in and turn up the heat and turn on the lights and i'm ready to go but because of my job and because of grad school there's not been a lot of creativity happening down here So, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> with the rings, mm -hmm. do you have custom orders for people with fat fingers? I do custom orders, yes. I do custom orders. Good. Jenna is, concerned be like an huh? Jenna is concerned your Etsy shop is on a break. Yeah, she's now yeah, it's on a break at the moment. I wonder if I should, should I open it? Do you guys want to see it? I don't know. I think, I think, okay. Let me, I don't know how to, well, you know what? I'm, I, I'm afraid I'll lose our signal. So I'm going to, I'll, yeah. I'll, do a, I'll do a soap inventory and then open it up. Yes, no, I mean, Jenna did put in the web, uh, the address for your Etsy and I'm not sure. We'll, we'll put in your, uh, yeah, where, I, I think she put it in earlier for the, my website has pictures and um, other things on it that will show you the, some of the stuff that I, the things that I make when I have time. That's why I'm really reluctant to go to year round school. Yeah. You did mention that and, um, because I love my summers. I need my summer so intensely. I'm going to retire in five years. And so I am even more jealous of my summers <laughs> than ever. I, I, my summers have brought me beautiful places to go to. Well, we've been to Wales and England 
um, in my precious summers, and um, I get to spend time down here. It's like people want to go to the Bahamas or the beach, or I'm like, no, nope, no, nope, I I'm going to the basement. It's where <laughs> I like to be is here in my basement studio. <laughs> well, that's that's your passion. Everything you put into that. Yeah, I just love it so much, and I find if I don't do anything creative, if I don't make myself do it, um, and I'm trying to write and I'm trying to do schoolwork for for my for school where I'm a teacher, um, I find I do better if I make myself take a creative break. I find that to recharge my batteries a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, I had to take a COVID extension on my current uh, papers that are due for the class I'm taking. Uh, I'm, I'm in the Masters of Celtic Studies program for the University of Wales, Trinity St. David. And I... Is that that's an online class? Uh, yes, distance learning, and it's through the university. And it is, it's hard. <laughs> it's really hard writing in a scholarly way. My two books are not written in a scholarly fashion. They're just written in a, woo, let's make some soap fashion. But these are written in a scholarly way. And I'm just sort of like, I just want to talk about things in my own way. But you can, of course, when you're doing an academic situation. So it takes a lot of brain power. And I wasn't smart at all for two weeks of having COVID. I don't know what happened to my brain, but it was hard not being smart. That'll come back. I hope so. (laughs) (laughs) Your next books are going to be scholarly. (laughs) I know the next books. Oh my gosh. I've got so many that I want to write, but uh, first I've got to write these assignments, which are pretty hard. (laughs) I found the word, but I don't see where to put in the, I don't see a place to enter chat. I see that. Over on the right hand side, there's yeah, a there's a there's a I can see people writing things. Uh, you should have a box at the bottom where you can put something. Oh, there's in. a box. That's the Welsh word for antiquarian. Did it come up? Nope, not yet. Shoot. Okay, well I can spell it. I surely can't say it. Hinaviathith. Hinaviathith. That's Welsh for antiquarian. You put it in there again. Nope. Yeah, no, it didn't come up. Oh, well. That's all right. Somebody had it on there. Second. Oh, if I was. Let me put it in the host chat again. H Y N A F I A E T H Y D D. It's like a question on a final for how to speak Welsh. It's really hard. H Y N A F I A E T H Y D D. Okay, I think I got it. <coughs> it's got the soft and the hard th in there. Fiv. Okay. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> in a, yeah, yeah, there it is. Don't <laughs> <laughs> say that six times fast. I don't think I could say it one time slow. <laughs> like when I was writing the. I had to write a paper on the Arthurian part of the Mabinogion and saying Guith Buith, Guith Buith, the, the game, the chess game that they play, Guith Buith. There it is. Jenna put up a link. Yeah. Oh, good. Cool. Like, well, very cool. So let's see. Um, you were talking about a little bit with your aromatherapy classes? Yeah, last last year I took several aromatherapy certification courses through the Tisserand Institute, which I would recommend to anyone if, for scientific background on aromatherapy. It's uh, He's one of the great writers on aromatherapy. If anybody has uh, Scott Cunningham's magical aroma magical aromatherapy book um tisserand wrote the 
the uh, preface to that, which I think is so funny that he okay. had sort of okay. veered into the esoteric lane for a while with Scott Cunningham um, to write the preface for that book. And he seems very down to earth and doesn't say anything even remotely. He didn't have any, there was no woo in his, in his teaching at all, but he seems to, he seemed at that time anyway, to think that there is more than just the chemistry going on that it's, there's an element of alchemy and what he calls synergy. When you put certain oils together, you get more than just the sum of its parts. You get something extra. And I, I believe that, and I have experienced that blending essential oils for 25 something years now working with the oils is uh, so amazing. And now I've been working with the plant oils, the fatty acid oils, like the apple seed oil and, um, there's so many properties just to the things that we just write off as a carrier, but there's so many carrier oils that have their own holistic healing, healing properties that it's such a fascinating, fascinating study. I am always learning new things. Yeah. How do you find the time to do everything that you do? I compartmentalize. I abandon my spinning wheels, the herd of them. I abandoned them occasionally and I had abandoned them for quite some time. And then I got my big wake up call and I thought, Oh, let's go make some yarn. Oh my gosh, the moth ate it all. So yeah. that was, was that, was that salvageable? Or was there it was 10% of it. I was able to save, which was a, still a considerable amount. I, a uh, knitters, uh, fiber artists have a thing called sable status for their uh, stashes. S A B L E uh, stash accumulation beyond life expectancy. And I think I had had that. And it was the decision was made for me to go away. Yeah, I understand that. When I learned how to crochet from my aunt, mm -hmm. it was 10. I never really did anything with it after that until I got pregnant with my daughter and then I started crocheting and I still have the, the Afghan that she taught me on. Oh, yeah, it's on my bed. But when she passed away, she had that. It was like just, she had three, you know, the big green trash bags. Yeah. Three of them full of yarn. Oh my gosh. That came to me. <laughs> oh my gosh! So you're it all the yarn. It took, it took forever, and then I started donating it to like after school programs right, at the right. after school because <coughs> just so much, and not many people were having babies, and you know, trying to figure out what am I going to do with all this yarn. But yeah, three big huge, three big three big bags full, three bags full, yeah. as they say. Yeah, yeah. It was like, oh, thank you. So of course I'm, you know, I'm the one they came to. It was like, okay, so for the longest time. I just had these trash bags in my laundry room and go down and like, okay, what am I going to make? What do I need? And there you go. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think handwork of any kind, things that last and that we keep. I mean, humans, we love to keep things. Um, I think when it's something that came through the hands of our foremothers, either directly from literally through their hands. I have miles of crocheted lace made by various of my grandmothers. Um, I have my great grandmother's uh, purple crystal service to use for drinks at a nice party. I have the things that I recall their hands on or their hands making or their hands tending. And I can connect with them so clearly through the objects of their toil, the objects of their pleasure. Um, and I, I don't know. It just is, is such an important connection to me. I'm very, very fortunate that I had such good ones. Yeah, I, I totally understand that. I have a lot of doilies that my grandmother made. Mm -hmm. Her beautiful tea set because I'm a, I'm a tea, tea obsessed person. <laughs> so I have teapots and teacups and, you know, I so do. I have her tea set, and uh, as I'm sitting here in my sanctuary room, I have her hope chest. So that's so sweet. I love that. That's wonderful. Yeah. So I it it really means a lot. I mean, she raised me for the first seven years of my life. So it was um, 
it's very, very important to me that I have these things. And like you said, knowing that they've gone through her hands. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I know nobody really uses doilies anymore, but when I, I use them. I use my grandmother's lace doilies too. Yeah. Um, when we went to the first place, the first time I saw a roundhouse created was when we went to Castel Hendless on, I don't remember what year pilgrimage we went to it. And there were drop spindles um, that there was this huge spindle inventory that they had found at Castel Hendless and that they had found a huge uh, a whorl, actually the whorls at um, mm. the Glastonbury Lake Village as well, the Somerset levels. And doing what they do, it's one of the core principles of Avalonian immersion is you take the tools they had and you do what they did and you figure out the way their brains worked. Um, and being able to connect with the, just with the drop spindle. I mean, people had to spin all the time. Didn't you think about what they didn't, uh, I mean, besides hides and skins, really, they had to, you know, weave, make string and put it together. And so seeing those looms, um, weaving is another, weaving is one thing that I don't do, but weaving is another great way to connect with our Avalonian foremothers, I think. Um, besides using, using this specific symbol of our two polarity goddesses and also using, um, using a loom when weaving is another unbelievably connective way because that's when we talk about, we, we sing the song spin, spun, spinning, woven, weaving. We do all of those things and to actually physically embody the action of running a shuttle back and forth. Or if you, you're using a tablet loom or a hanging loom, just the idea of building up the story of, of life of women's work and women's lives. I think, we can connect with them so intensely to our spiritual foremothers by doing what they did in taking the same tools they had, sticks and stones and bunny, what do they call the dust bunnies, I guess. <laughs> like, this, <laughs> like this poof. I still have one poof left of, the, um, of some Shetland wool that I bought in Wales. Um, I saw one puff left. I'm reluctant to spin it because that's all I have left after all the bales of it I bought and brought over, brought back. But yeah, I think that's one of the most important ways to connect is to do what they did with the tools that they had. Yeah, it's very special. I, I love the way you put Avalon in everything. I do. I it's yeah. after all these years, it's become. It's not even. I can't even say it's like a practice because it's woven so completely into what I think when we've been doing this work for so long, it becomes mm -hmm. woven into everything that we do. I don't stir a soap pot. I don't stir a soup pot. I don't make up dough without thinking of what I can, what intention I can put in it while I'm working. I just, it's just so immersed in, in everything that I do. Um, and at work, of course, you don't go around and claim things, but there's spaces in my workspace that are very specifically Avalonian and nobody knows about it, but me, but. Well, that's what's important. Yeah. And so we, um, I don't know if you guys on the news, there's been such terrible news lately. There was um, the, the praying, football coach he was at that was the school that that's my school the guy that went up to the oh. supreme court and because he was mad because we because the school district didn't renew his contract after he wouldn't stop praying with the students after school if i went out there and and called in the corners and <laughs> oh, that would be interesting well, they would have they'd burn me at the stake at halftime that would just be <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it's kind of interesting the way that they um, are it, that the way our school got famous, famous for that. So hopefully, well, I don't know. We'll see what happens. But. Well, we're getting up toward nine. So oh, yeah, uh, it's so late. I'm still three. I'm three hours behind you guys. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone have any questions? If you do, you can pop them in the chat. I see Jenna. I see 
Diana. And someone's on as Sisterhood of Avalon. And I see Audrey and Shaw. And oh, yes, I want to know if Duolingo knows how to pronounce that word. <laughs> oh, has anybody come up with it? I, oh, I don't know. Hina via Thethawith. That's my best guess at the moment. <laughs> I love it, Diana, that you've got some of your Italian granny's lace and crochet work. It is. It's so, it's so awesome to have it. That's why Shawls for Sisters is such a great program that we have. Because I love Shawls for Sisters. I, love, I just love it. I re have received two in my time, and they are such treasures because they carry so much with them. Yeah, I haven't received any, but I have made a couple and, and sent them to Sharon. So I just, I just think it's a wonderful thing. Yeah, it yeah. is. It's pretty special. So is there anything else you would like to share with us before we wrap up? Well, I feel kind of lonely for sisters in the midst of all my, in the midst of all my study about Welsh things right now, I'm feeling very disconnected because I'm so busy with my head in the books. And I have to say, most of the people that I've been studying, they're all a bunch of men, which I think is kind of funny. And I don't know if they're, they're just the ones to publish first or what the deal is, but uh, so many men, all the men. And they seem to be very, you know, men who are doing super interesting things. Um, but it's like, it's really an interesting interesting thing to see that there just aren't that very aren't that many men aren't that many women that are getting any get getting any traction and i'm not mm -hmm. sure why that is um, we got to meet the archaeologist uh francis lynch on one of our pilgrimages she's the one who excavated bronwyn's tomb in the 60s and she and peggy piggott are probably the main celtic archaeologists that i know of but everybody else, a bunch of boys. How about that? Later, Celtic is disturbing. Yeah, <laughs> we got to change that. <laughs> so let's see. Um, what I'd like to do is, if you do get your twenty fifth anniversary of your book. Oh, I would love to. I, I'm going to propose. I haven't done it yet. I'm. And I'd love to have you back. I'd love to have you back and talk about it. Of course, it would be so fun. I get. To, I feel like we get to have like a little mini mini gathering here with sisters uh, that would be great and i would definitely i will talk to jenna at our next coracle committee meeting and i would love to have us sponsor you in a in a drop spindle workshop absolutely i would be totally down for that that would be great okay awesome so before we wrap up i just want to mention to everyone that um tomorrow there is um coracle is presenting a workshop with Mara Starling. Oh, it's so exciting. Yeah, so exciting. It's uh, 12 to 2 Eastern time. And I don't have, I know her book, I don't have it. It's on uh, Welsh witchcraft. So that is going to be fascinating. Um, do we still, Jenna, if you can hear me, um, can they still register or is it too late? So that's tomorrow, and our next Coracle Live is the beginning of June, and that will be with uh, Jenna Green, musician. Okay, it's an in tomorrow is an introduction to Welsh tradition and folk practice. Oh, that's so exciting. And you can still register until probably tomorrow morning or this evening, uh, at least Eastern time. And um, again, Jenna Green, will be chatting with her on, let's... This is the first Friday in June. Keep an eye on the Sisterhood of Avalon page for um, for the announcement, and that will be great. Bun, I thank you so so much. Oh, I'm being, so I'm right? just so happy to be among sisters. It just makes me yeah, feel, yeah. Makes me feel, yeah. feel and this was great because I didn't know you that well. And <laughs> It's been great to meet you. Yeah, so much. Again, I thank you. And uh, I will be in touch about the other things. Okay, absolutely. 
All right. Thank you. Thank and you, everybody. It's so good to see my sisters. Hello. Some of you I don't know, and some of you I know, and I miss all of you. <laughs> okay. Bye. You take care. All right. Thank you so much. Good night. Okay, bye.